Hey, what's up, nerds? Paul here at Radio Free Hammer Hall, and today I want to take a look back on five years of Age of Sigmar. We are just about at the five-year anniversary of the game, so I wanted to really go through a detailed kind of history of where we've been, where we're going, and, uh, you know, maybe some things along the way that we've kind of forgotten about and assemble it into, I don't know, a little, uh, few pages of history. Keep it kind of written down and be able to look back on all of this. So, we kind of have to begin before the real beginning. Uh, so in early 2015, we started getting rumors and leaks and people speculating because we had, you know, the release of the end times and it definitely seemed like that was leading up to a new edition and major changes. People were speculating about armies getting taken out of the game and round bases, which turned out to be true. Um, all sorts of rumors. Um, what I encourage people to do, rather than going through some of the crazy rumors that we had, I encourage people to go back in the archives of Warhammer Weekly, and for that early part of 2015 leading up to Age of Sigmar, watch the news segments of Warhammer Weekly. Because that was chock full of what all of the wild and crazy rumors were. Um, some of them made no sense, and a lot of things ended up being true or partially true, or they were right, but somebody didn't actually know what they were looking at. Um, so it was a really interesting time, and the majority thinking was that it was just going to be a new edition of Warhammer Fantasy Battles. Not that we were going to have this giant game change and have Warhammer Fantasy Battles really kind of dead and Age of Sigmar taking its place as the sort of spiritual successor to it and the, you know, using all of the same models and carrying that over. People didn't quite see that coming. And I... I think that was really interesting that, it, you know, Warhammer Fantasy Battles was really a struggling game at that time, and um, it needed a big shakeup. So, then we got Age of Sigmar launching. One of the first things that we got out of Age of Sigmar uh, was the four pages of rules. And everybody kind of scratching their heads and saying, how can we go from, geez, I don't even know how big the Big Red rule book was, but it was a very large rule book. And how do we then take that down to four pages of rules? And, oh, by the way, where are the points? How do we know how to build our armies? How do we know how to put things together? Um... And this immediately turned a lot of people away. It was just entering this like wild west of Age of Sigmar. We had this period of time where it was chaos. Nobody really knew what was going on. Everybody was kind of trying to figure it out, figuring out how to play the game and make it fun and fair. Um, and we weren't getting a lot of help from Games Workshop at this point. Um, we did, in addition to the four pages of rules, get the PDF compendiums that were all of the war scrolls for all of the armies from Warhammer Fantasy Battles. Uh, basically, everything from 8th edition got a war scroll or had like a substitute war scroll in the back of the compendium that said, okay, this unit you play as this, or, you know, your Bretonian Lord... You can run him on a Pegasus, and his movement increases to 16 inches. Stuff like that. Um, we had the launch of the Stormcast Eternals, and with that, we also got the Corn Bloodbound, which would kind of evolve later on. 
but we got that initial release of Stormcast Eternals, which was an army that a lot of people really liked. It's a little bit divisive because um, a lot of people felt that it was kind of like a fantasy copy of Space Marines, and that kind of put some people off to it. But speaking of people being put off to it, there was massive fractures in the community from the launch of Age of Sigmar. Some people just said, forget it, I'm just going to keep playing 8th edition. And there are still occasionally 8th edition tournaments, there even other editions of Warhammer tournaments that still happen, people getting together and playing games, and that's great. Um, there's still uh, an active Facebook community for Warhammer Fantasy. Um, you know, there's still people out there loving the game, even though it is no longer actively supported. Some players exited Warhammer entirely and went to play Kings of War instead, which had a lot of similarities to... Uh, Warhammer 8th edition but was uh, in a lot of ways much simpler in Age of Sigmar was also a much simpler version of Warhammer and Kings of War just kind of takes it in a different direction and the game has uh, definitely developed since then um, I do have friends that play it um, and swear by the game I mean, it does sound like it has developed a lot more from where it was in the early days of Age of Sigmar. And um, that definitely, that was a game that already had a strong community and it just blew up with the launch of Age of Sigmar with a lot of people saying, well, I can just use these models for this other game. And uh, Kings of War also released a bunch of additional army books to sort of slot in and fit with the Warhammer fantasy armies. So it, they really were very welcoming to, you know, the former Warhammer players that were looking for uh, a continued, you know, rank and flank style game. Then there was the Ninth Age Project, which was a bunch of people that said, we like Warhammer Fantasy, we don't like Kings of War, we don't like Age of Sigmar, we want to make a new edition of Warhammer. So they really took Warhammer Fantasy and created a new edition. Um, they rewrote the rule books, they adjusted the core rules, they made a lot of improvements, and I think if that had been released instead of Age of Sigmar, I think a lot of people would probably have been happy with it. Um, but it was a community-built game, and so it was a very rocky start, at very least. And I'm not sure um, at this point where it stands. Um, I think there were a lot of people that kind of bailed on it eventually because it, the rules kept changing, they kept updating it was a very fluid sort of rule set it kept getting patches and updates so, but anyway I don't want to focus too much on the games that aren't Age of Sigmar but this is just really um, highlighting how contentious the initial launch of this game was and from where we sit now, five years in hindsight, this launch was terrible. Like, it was not what people expected, not what people wanted, and the game didn't feel complete. Especially compared to where we're at now, the game having five years of development and releases, and it being really, in a lot of ways, unrecognizable compared to that initial launch of Age of Sigmar. Everything's different now. So in the second half of 2015, we started getting battle tomes. Um, and technically the first battle tome was actually the Chaos Dreadhold book uh, that went along with uh, this 
big terrain set that was, you know, a big chaos fortress. I, I don't personally own it. There, you see a lot of pieces of the chaos dreadhold around on uh, gaming tables. A lot of stores bought sets, and people kind of use chunks of it as terrain pieces. Um, you know, obviously, we got our Stormcast Eternals and Cord and Bloodbound books right on the heels of the release, so that those new newly launched armies had books. Um, we also got the Seraphon book, which interestingly, that book basically stood for five years. We just now got an updated book for Seraphon. They kind of bookended Age of Sigmar in a way. You know, they were one of the very first battle tomes that got released, and they were the last battle tome to get a second edition update. Um, so they were stuck with very old rules for a very long time. And then, towards the end of the year, we also got the Ever Chosen book, which was four units, and actually, was it four units or was it three? I think it was three units. It had more battalions in the book than it had um, actual war scrolls, but we got fantastic models out of it. You know, the new Archeon model was outstanding. The Varengard are still really beautiful models. Um, the Gaunt Summoner is a great model. It, In terms of sculpts, um, we were seeing very early that they were really jumping on this, like, newfound freedom of round bases and skirmish movement and uh really taking all of that to a new level and exploring a lot of model design space that they really hadn't been able to do much before and in this new style of game you had you know a, a giant named character like Archeon that was actually a viable thing to play and actually put on the battlefield so it really was changing the landscape. I, I feel like the release of Archeon in particular was really kind of planting a flag in the ground and saying these big centerpiece models that everybody loves but nobody played with before, um, we're, we're doing that now. Uh, we also got a bunch of campaign books in that time period um, and books that had scenarios in them, which was... You know, at least for myself, I had found a PDF collection of all of the scenarios out of a bunch of those books. Um, and that was sort of the early way that I was playing Age of Sigmar. I, you know, the just run up and fight was obviously not the optimal way to play. But then when you start mixing in... Uh, a scenario into it, and really most of them were very narrative scenarios, but it really kind of laid that groundwork for realizing, oh, this game is much better when you are playing for objectives as opposed to just running up and killing each other. Um, so that was, I think, a really important thing that started happening pretty early on in the Age of Sigmar development. Um, in terms of community, it was probably in late 2015 that people started building comp systems for Age of Sigmar to sort of compensate for not having points. They were coming up with their own point systems, essentially, to try and figure out a more fair way to play the game. And we'll find out later that those comp systems were actually uh, part of of the development of the official point system of Age of Sigmar, and a lot of that actually ported over uh, because there was a lot of consistency in those rule sets, and um, you know a good chunk of it rolled over when Games Workshop actually put points to the game. So early 2016, this is where start things started to really change. Uh, we got the Grand Alliance books that released. And with that, 
we saw the formation of what the new armies in Age of Sigmar were going to look like. With each of the four Grand Alliance books that came out, at the same time, a ton of models got discontinued. And each Grand Alliance book left out lots of war scrolls that were in the compendiums and just didn't carry them over into these new books. Uh, and the Bretonia and Tomb Kings lines were completely discontinued and were not at all included in these new books. A lot of the existing armies were also ghettoized into smaller factions. You had, you know, some things even as small as like Firebellies was you know, one model in a sub-faction. You know, we had a lot of these things that were very fractured, tiny pieces of armies. A lot of them didn't actually even function as armies. Um, just a lot of subdivision and different pieces of things slotting together. Also in early 2016, we had Fire Slayers launch, and that was our first totally new army in Age of Sigmar after Stormcast Eternals. Stormcast were very much like the poster child of um, Age of Sigmar, and Fire Slayers started to give us a look at what do these legacy races look like in the mortal realms. It started giving us more backstory of um, what's happening outside of what the Stormcast Eternals are doing. And we had other battle tomes that also came out um, that were for existing armies. Uh, so we got Skaven Pestilence. We got the second Stormcast Eternals book for the Extremist Chamber. That was like their second uh, release of Stormcast Eternals. Um, we got the Iron Jaws battle tome, which gave us a bunch of new models and basically a new army altogether. Um, it just had... Uh, what were formerly Black Orcs, now Ard Boys uh, from the old Orcs and Goblins book. Uh, they were sort of like the basis of um, that new design of Orcs. And then we also got Flesh Eater Quartz, which was uh, basically just uh, existing models out of the Vampire Counts line, sort of reorganized into a new book. Now, it's important to note that with these new books that are being released, they're basically just War Scrolls. And all of the War Scrolls are all available for free online. So there's this kind of weird situation with this. That um, these books were mainly like art and fluff. And then they had the War Scrolls at the back. There were no additional rules for these armies at that time. And we're getting up now to a point where that's about to change. But up till now, all of these books are really just War Scrolls art and fluff. And shaping the world as we know it. But big changes are around the corner in summer of 2016. We got the first General's Handbook released, and we didn't even know that it was the first General's Handbook, we just knew it as the General's Handbook. We didn't know that there were going to be more General's Handbooks that came after. This gave us a point system for all of the War Scrolls, and gave us army composition rules, it had some additional match play rules that sort of patched up some of you know those initial four pages of rules. Uh, we got scenarios for match play. We got uh, the introduction of reinforcement points because up to this point, um, summoning was like out of control. Like you could just keep putting more models on the table uh, willy nilly, and there was no regulation of it and what this 
uh, set of rules about reinforcement points did was it made you set aside a pool of points in your army to summon new units onto the battlefield. You were still playing, you know, your 2,000 point army. You just had this sort of variable slot in your army with, you know, these different things that you might be able to summon. The big other thing that we got was the introduction of allegiance abilities. Uh, we initially started with just the four Grand Alliances uh, having different allegiance abilities. They were pretty basic. Um, we also got command traits and artifacts, which uh, become huge parts of books later on. But this is laying the initial groundwork for you know real rules of putting your army together. And now we can't forget also that this book was separated into three sections. Open play, narrative play, and match play. And the thing that always gets lots of attention is match play. That's what is played in tournaments. That's what most people play pickup games of. But in that section in the first General's Handbook, we got a bunch of different ideas from multiplayer rules, multiplayer scenarios. We got our initial rules for Path to Glory campaigns, and we got a bunch of narrative battle plans. So there was really, again, laying the groundwork for other ways to play Age of Sigmar, that it wasn't going to just be this points-based system that that initial idea that they kind of had when they launched the rules of it kind of being this big open sandbox, they're really, with open play and narrative play, really kind of acknowledging that that is still kind of a thing that they want to do. And we want to give people a lot of options on how they play their games and add in ideas of how to actually play those games in different ways. So on the heels of the General's Handbook released, we got our first set of battle tomes that had allegiance abilities in them. And Sylvaneth was the first one out of all of those. We got our full set of artifacts for that army, we got command traits, we got spells, and we got our first faction terrain pieces in the form of the Sylvaneth Wildwoods which was repurposing kits that already existed, but it was adding army-specific rules to them and the ability to place additional terrain on the battlefield, which was something completely new and had not been in the rule books before. We also got the Bone Splitters Battle Tome and Beast Claw Raiders, and these three battle tomes really started to make it clear that armies with these new books are definitely stronger than the existing books. That were all of the other armies that we had are kind of at a little bit of a disadvantage compared to these three new books that came out. Kind of have a haves and have-nots situation that starts to develop. And it's not really big and obvious. You know, the Beast Claw Raiders book definitely had some things in it with War Scroll updates that made it very strong. Sylvaneth was really strong. Um, and the Cunning Ruck out of the Bone Splitters book was very good and very oppressive at times. Um, but then it gets worse because, you know, these books are just sort of you know, things that are out there that, um, you know, they're adding some rules in, but there's a few things here and there that are strong in the battle tomes, but the books overall were not, like, completely busted. And that's about to change. Our first release in 2017 was the Disciples of Zinch book, was our that was really our first example of a book that was just totally broken. Um, 
There were a number of really outstanding army builds there. It really became a dominant force in tournaments uh, and, you know, your local gameplay. It was not a fun army to play against. Um, it introduced, you know, new mechanics and um, it was just really strong. After that, we got Stormcast Eternals getting their third Battle Tome. Now, you know, with the full set of Allegiance abilities. And we got Blades of Corn, which was sort of the update and successor to the Corn Bloodbound Battle Tome. Now, also incorporating the Corn Demons in there as well. Uh, both of those, you know, getting full Allegiance abilities and. Corn getting its blood tithe system, Stormcast Eternals getting their special rules, um, and I believe the Stormcast Eternals book, I think, may have been the first book with mount traits, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, but in any case, um, our last book on the first half of 2017 was. Caradron Overlords, which was another totally busted book. Um, really, really oppressive shooting. Very powerful. Um, and some things in it seemed off on the launch. Like, you know, there being builds of units that weren't in the box. So that really made things difficult for people that really wanted to rush and put the optimal units on the table and have them modeled correctly. Um, that was very challenging and very expensive. Um, and as we saw very quickly, the gap between the haves and the have-nots just definitely got wider. And, you know, now we have multiple broken books. We have the Stormcast Eternals book that had the Vanguard Wing build as well. Blades of Corn had, you know, blood letter bombs. Like, all of these new books that were coming out felt like they were at a much higher power level than all of the other existing armies. Uh, also, in this time period, we got the Skirmish book released, which was the first attempt at Age of Sigmar on a smaller scale. It was using single models instead of units. And um, it, I think parts of it still kind of hold up, but it never really caught on. Uh, the scenarios in it, though, are definitely great for more casual play, and later on they, I think, are really good for Path to Glory uh, as well. But at this release itself was really kind of a miss. Um, Around the same time, we get the release of Shadespire, our first Underworlds game. And we started getting model releases for the Shadespire Warbands. Um, a lot of those now are sort of notoriously playable but bad in Age of Sigmar. Not too many of them are actually really all that good. Um, however... The sculpts are fantastic, and a lot of people use those as alternate sculpts for things like unit champions and just adding sculpts to existing units to vary them up. Um, so it really artistically added a lot to the game, although, um, you know, I think Shadespire itself sort of suffered a little bit. It wasn't really that resounding of a success. Um, I think out of all of the sales of Shadespire, my guess is that the majority of those sales of the models were actually for people wanting alternate sculpts for their Age of Sigmar units and not for playing Shadespire and not for um, actually using those Shadespire Warband War Scrolls in Age of Sigmar. So, summer of 2017, we get our second General's Handbook. And this one, I think it was important to note that it said on the cover, General's Handbook 2017, 
which really signaled, I think, to everyone that this was going to be an annual update that we get. So we got updated points for almost everything. The compendium units, all of the stuff that had been previously discontinued, you know, Bretonia, Tomb Kings, all the special characters, um, all of the other units that just got discontinued, their points were left out of this book. They were in the first General's Handbook, but they weren't here. And a lot of people didn't really know what that meant. Um, for a lot of people, they continued to use the points out of the first General's Handbook and just continue to play with their toys, and that was fine. Um, other people kind of considered that as kind of not exactly a banning of those models, but it was, you know, an indication that we really shouldn't be playing with those things anymore. And, you know, at this point, you know, we still have points now for all of that compendium stuff, but between War Scroll changes and just the development of the game, it's something that's really not used anymore. We got more updates here to match play rules to make the rule set more robust and complete and more fair. We got, with this, a big set of allegiance abilities for most of the existing armies. Um, and we also got our lists of allies and all those sorts of things. With that, it was really just you know a battle trait command traits and artifacts for each of those. We also got some battalions for certain armies, and we got a new set of battle plans for our match play scenarios. A big thing that happened around this time was all of the errata and FAQ for the Karadran Overlords book that made everything more closely aligned to what was in the box as opposed to how things were initially printed on the War Scrolls. We found out in here that the there was miscommunication between the modeling department and the rules team about what was going to be in the boxes. And there was also a problem where they sent the wrong version of the book to the printers. So... Uh, a beta version of the book what w was what was actually printed and wasn't you know the final version of it so we had a lot of errata and faq to update that and that was extremely controversial because a lot of people had already dumped a lot of money and time into building converting uh trying to make their karajan overlords armies what they wanted to be based on what was in that initial book release and then it all got turned on its head fairly quickly um it was a few months it was just long enough that people had spent a lot of money and it was a very compelling army visually and a very strong army mechanically so it drew a lot of people in so there were a lot of unhappy people with those changes i think overall they were probably good for the game that they changed those things um, but it still left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths, and that's probably um, one of the greatest errors that they really have ever made in you know, putting out an army book. Um, in our narrative and open play uh, parts of this General's Handbook, we got Triumph and Treachery rules, which is definitely a fun way to play. I've done that a couple of times. And we also got more narrative scenarios uh, in that book. Um, you know, continuing on these suggestions for narrative gameplay and some different scenarios uh, to go along with that. There were also some other minor rule sets in there. Uh, in the narrative play section, um, which kind of comes along in each different uh, General's Handbook. Um, just sort of these, like, one-page things, uh, like, you know, like Siege Warfare, I think, is one of them. I don't remember which General's Handbook it's in. Um, 
but uh, just a lot of ideas for interesting narrative ways to play the game. Uh, this General's Handbook, I think, was really a big turning point for the game. The first General's Handbook adding points to the game was just kind of setting everything up and saying, okay, now this feels like a complete game. We have points, we know how to build armies. Um, we have some allegiance abilities, but they're not really that impactful. Um, you know, here is our basis. And then the 2017 General's Handbook comes out and we get, you know, these allegiance abilities for almost every army in the game. You know, all of like the functional armies get these allegiance abilities and it suddenly makes most of these armies feel playable you don't have as much of the haves and have nots of the armies that have gotten their own battle tomes versus all of these other armies that were uh just sort of languishing now you had you know, real playable options you had allegiance abilities, command traits, artifacts for, you know, a myriad of armies, and a lot of them were pretty strong and really shook up the metagame and made a lot more armies viable in the face of the other armies that had had battle tomes already uh, in sort of this new era of Age of Sigmar. So, Late 2017, we did get a couple of things in here. We got the Open War cards, which are a set of cards that are similar to the Warcry uh, scenario decks, where you have um, uh, uh, deployment rules, a uh, objective scenario. Uh, I forget exactly what it's called in there, and then a twist, like a special rule for that game. Um, that is an excellent way to play. There's a lot of good things in there. Um, it's something that, like, I I think I've only played with a couple of times, but like, I love the idea of, and I want to play with that more. And those things all still hold up to, you know, where Age of Sigmar is currently. Um, that really, I think, is a pretty evergreen release. And um, it did later on kind of get updated and included in the General's Handbook in sort of a modified version. Um, we also got the Path to Glory campaign book. The initial Path to Glory rules that we got in the first General's Handbook uh, didn't include all of the armies. And the Path to Glory campaign book gave us, uh, you know, the Path to Glory rules and basically filled in the gaps of all of the other armies that didn't have their own Path to Glory rules. Um, once we started getting uh, Battle Tomes with Allegiance abilities, we started getting Path to Glory rule sets and tables in each Battle Tome. And this just kind of rounded that out and gave us you know, additional ways to play every army and gave us a lot of um, a lot of new options for playing Path to Glory. I think I've beat this drum many times before, but I think Path to Glory is like the most underplayed way to play Age of Sigmar. It is a fantastic rule system. It's a lot of fun games can be quick and brutal and um, I love Path to Glory and everybody should play it. Now both of those came out in August and then for the remainder of the year we got nothing. Nothing at all. Um, I believe this was coinciding with a new edition of Warhammer 40k which um you know, a lot of the release space uh, was given up to that. And a lot of Games Workshop's energy was put into that. So for Age of Sigmar, we really had this big lull 
from August through December of just having no releases whatsoever, no books, um, you know, Open War and Path to Glory were sort of these casual play kind of things. So if you were playing just match play Age of Sigmar, you got nothing for six months. And um, that really was an interesting opportunity to see the game develop and see the metagame develop and mature for the first time. But right at the end of 2017, we got some information from Games Workshop on some upcoming releases, namely a fantastic video previewing uh, the Nurgle Battle Tome uh, and the announcement of the beginning of Malign Portents. So in early 2018, we have this Malign Portents phase of Age of Sigmar begin, and it is definitely feeling like it's leading up to something. And a lot of the narrative uh, was really being driven at this time. The new battle tomes that came out had new branding, like a new uh, you know, logo for Age of Sigmar. Uh, the binding was different. And we started getting books kind of rapid fire at this point. We got four books in six months. Uh, we got Maggotkin of Nurgle, Legions of Nagash, and Legions of Nagash was really interesting because it was the first time that we saw multiple armies that had their own allegiance abilities getting lumped together into one new army book. Uh, we got Daughters of Cain released and Ideneth Deepkin released. Uh, which was a totally new army. Daughters of Cain was about half new. Nurgle, we got a few new models. Legions of Nagash was, uh, you know, no model updates, but, you know, this massive change where we basically put all of death, except for Flesh Eater Quartz, into one book, which was very interesting, and it turned out to be a very strong book for quite a while. So all through this time, you know, the Malign Portance website had like a literal countdown to whatever the Malign Portance event was. Um, we didn't really know where it was going, but we soon found out. So the end of Malign Portance really was... Um, it was really a shift narratively into a new storyline. Um, but it coincided with the release of Age of, Age of Sigmar's new edition. Um, so we got our second edition of Age of Sigmar, or AOS 2.0, or whatever you want to call it. I don't know if it is officially called second edition, but I always sort of refer to it that way. We got the core rules updated and expanded we went from having four pages of rules to 12 so we tripled the size of our rules uh, you know we had command points introduced we had new summoning mechanics introduced we got a core book which had the rules and some uh, rules for the realms and battle plans and a whole lot of narrative and art um, it, it's one of the best books I think that they've ever put out um, I still carry it around with me it's a great source of uh, you know fluff for Age of Sigmar it's a good reference you know it has that useful information in it um we had the release at this time of the Malign Sorcery box, um, which introduced uh, endless spells to us. You know, physical models, real manifestations of magic on the battlefield. And we also got uh, expanded rules for all of the realms, including realm artifacts. So now we had this big set 
of sort of generic artifacts to choose from in addition to what was in Battle Tomes and what was in the General's Handbook. So that was really a major shift as well in how the game played. And we also, at the same time, got the 2018 General's Handbook released, which once again updated points, it updated some of the Allegiance abilities, gave us some new battalions, we got new scenarios and updated scenarios, and in the open uh, play section, we got the open war cards um, sort of revamped into tables in uh, the General's Handbook, so it was sort of codified in a different way. Um, it's not quite as robust as the open war deck, but it is... Uh, still definitely a, a very good inclusion in there. Um, and again, Open War is one of those things that I, I would just wish more people played. Uh, and, and in addition to this, we of course got more um, narrative play scenarios and ways, ideas for narrative games and more multiplayer rules, all sorts of things um, in the open play and narrative play sections. Um, you know, each General's Handbook really has something new and interesting for open play and narrative play. They really aren't, like, updates on previous stuff. It's just a constant flow of new stuff. So it's really, you know, making it clear at this point that all of these General Handbooks, um, other than the points, are... Well, I would say not even just the points, but the... Uh, apart from the match play section, the open play and narrative play portions of these books are really pretty evergreen. Like, they're, you want to keep these books around because there's stuff from each one. Uh, if you're playing open play or narrative play, you have some interesting options there in each book uh, to, you know, pull out scenarios, pull out new ways to play, and uh, just give you more options. It I still have all of my General's Handbooks. I pulled out my General's Handbooks to make this video. Um, and uh, it was sort of like a fun trip down memory lane to see all the things that have changed over time and um, the other things that you know I haven't even necessarily played, but just seeing the open play and narrative play develop over time. So, second half of 2018. Uh, we got our second edition battle tome for Stormcast Eternals. So that was their fourth battle tome. Um, this was the first new release that had army endless spell as opposed to the malign sorcery endless spells. Ah, and I just accidentally hit a button. Did not mean to do that. Now, I, of course, I forgot the rest of what was on that slide. Uh, I know Night Haunt came out in that time period, and we also had one other Battle Tome release um, in there. And that led us to a total of seven new Battle Tomes in 2018. And that was just getting warmed up. So over the course of 2019, we got 12 new battle tomes in one year. Now, the 2018 books, those were all second edition battle tomes, even the ones that came before the release of second edition. Um, they were all, uh, you know, set up with rule sets for second edition in mind. 2019, we just got this deluge of new battle tomes. Gloomspite Gits, Flesh Eater Quartz, Skaven, Blades of Corn, Fire Slayers, Heathen Knights of Slanesh, Sylvaneth, Orc War Clans, Cities of Sigmar, Ossiarch Bone Reapers, Ogre Mort Maw Tribes, and Slaves to Darkness. If you went back in time to 2015, before Age of Sigmar was released or even just after Age of Sigmar was released when you're in that chaotic period 
if you told somebody that coming up in a couple of years, you're going to have a year where you have 12 new books released. And amongst that, you have one totally new army and a couple of other armies that get new releases along with them. They're sort of consolidations and um, expansions on previous um, armies. Uh, if you told somebody that in 2015, they would have told you you were lying. Like, Games Workshop has never released anything on this pace ever before. And it really was going a long way towards having sort of a completeness of second edition. At this point, we had 19 second edition battle tomes by the end of 2019. And that is a whole lot. 2019 General's Handbook. This was probably the most disappointing General's Handbook that we've gotten so far. Um... There's a lot of different reasons for that. Uh, we got meeting engagements, which uh, is a match play way to play that um, really was not popular, and it felt like they spent a lot of time out of the production of this General's Handbook on meeting engagements, and it really just fell flat. Um, and so it really left a lot of the rest of the General's Handbook feeling like it was lacking. Um, you know, it, we did get updated scenarios. We got mercenary companies, which appear to be going away in the next General's Handbook. Uh, for narrative play, we got the uh, Battles of Elixia. And... Uh, we got hidden agendas in open play, which also have been used as secondary objectives for match play games. Um, and the sort of big insult slash joke that ogres are as deadly as ever, um, really just sort of telling us that there was a new ogre battle tome on the way. But a lot of people were pretty pissed at that at the time because that was a really bad army that didn't have allegiance abilities. <laughs> and, um... It just kind of felt like a slap in the face at the time, although in retrospect now it was sort of a cheeky wink and a nod that a new book was coming. Also, around this time, we had Warcry released, which is the first really successful, smaller scale Age of Sigmar game. We had a whole bunch of new warbands released specifically for Warcry, and then we got uh, subsequent card packs for other existing armies uh, so that you can play basically almost any Age of Sigmar army in Warcry. And it was a fun game that really took off very quickly. It's quick to play. It had a really good rule set. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's a great sort of filler game in between uh, other games of Age of Sigmar. The models are fantastic out of the warbands that were released. And um, it also came with several terrain sets. At, you know, the starter box had, you know, its initial set of terrain, and then there were other uh, additional terrain boxes that got released. Um, and all of those were uh, really fantastic sets of terrain. Um, and it it felt like Warcry overall was a really well thought out, good addition to the sort of Age of Sigmar family. It did things that Shadespire didn't do. You know, I didn't you know, note all of the different Underworlds editions that came out uh, in here, but there were a bunch more. Um, and it was sort of on the same scale as Skirmish, but had much better rules. Um, and I think this is something that still has some popularity, and uh, 
it definitely feels like there is staying power to Warcry. That we're going to have this around for a while. Um, I personally haven't played in a little bit. Uh, a lot of that is because of uh, the current global pandemic that we're in. Um, but uh, it's it was a fantastic release. It, they really knocked it out of the park with that one. I think they finally came to a small scale uh, tabletop skirmish game that works. So, early 2020, we get Caradron Overlords, Disciples of Zinj, and Seraphon all getting their second edition armies, or their second edition battle tomes, rather. And that completes Age of Sigmar, basically. And sliding in just in time before the COVID-19 outbreak really took hold everywhere. So now we're in this position where we have 22 Age of Sigmar armies. All of our armies have battle tomes. There's no other stragglers that are not really in battle tomes apart from, uh, you know, a couple of things here and there like Shadespire Warbands along the way somewhere. Um, Gotrek was released. Um, a couple of other single models and things like that here and there that were just sort of snuck in and were other additions that aren't necessarily in battle tomes. But they're, you know, a free war scroll away from being included. We don't have chunks of units anymore that don't have a home. Everything has been uh, brought back into an army book, a battle tome. And we're currently at 22 different armies and books. 22. Um, COVID-19 has come and disrupted production for a period of time. Thankfully, the last book, Seraphon, got in just under the wire before everything shut down. Um, and right now, we're sort of at a little bit of a standstill. We've got a little bit of what's coming up in the future and some leaks starting to come out. So we know right now, as I'm recording this, uh, we're just getting some previews of General's Handbook 2020, and we have the initial box set for the Lumineth Realm Lords that was released, and we know the rest of that army is coming very soon. We don't know exactly when. Um, the other thing that I did not mention in here was the Sons of Bahamut, we know is another army that is coming, that is our Giants army. Um, so that will bring us up to 24 Age of Sigmar armies. And, you know, there's a couple of rumors and whispers here and there of what might be coming in the future, and some speculation about what might be coming in the future. But... We don't really have anything solid right now. And for now, um, I'm just going to kind of leave it there. Uh, I don't want to talk about what might be coming in the future. Um, but overall, our future of Age of Sigmar looks bright. We have Games Workshop really being on top of things. They went from being a very opaque company to being very in touch with the community and having, you know, it would still be nice if we had a release schedule um, or longer lead time on releases. But, you know, at least now we kind of get the official announcement that something is coming two weeks before it comes and then pre-order a week before it comes and a bunch of articles in that two week lead up uh, that kind of give us some idea of what that release is going to be all about um, you know they're all over Facebook and social media now they are um, also in here I forget exactly when this happened I think it coincided with the beginning of second edition that we're also getting 
these PDF updates every six months with rules, tweaks, FAQs, erratas, um, designers commentary, whatever you want to call it. We're getting, you know, updates every six months on that. Um, you know, we're getting a PDF with, uh, that comes right after the general's handbook that updates the points of anything that came out too close to the release of the general's handbook to be included in it. That like the general's handbook had already gone off to the printers before, uh, they knew what the impact of a new army book was going to be. You know, we have pretty consistently after an army book comes out, we get errata and FAQ about a month later. Um, it's very consistent now. It is a totally new games workshop. And, you know, everything is in a really good place right now. Yes, you're always going to have, as we do right now, some armies that seem really overpowered. But we're in a place where the majority of armies are in a pretty consistent quality and are lots of fun to play against each other. Um, when you take out the outliers on the top side, there's, interestingly enough, not really outliers on the bottom side. We don't have books that are really, really subpar. Um, we have a really robust, um, fat middle of the game, um, where all of those armies feel pretty well matched to each other, and then we always have a few that are much more powerful than they should be and eventually get reined in with errata FAQ and points changes. Um, it doesn't really feel like too many things um, last longer than that General's Handbook or FAQ update every six months. Those usually correct whatever problems exist. And that has led to a really healthy game. Uh, tournaments are drawing record numbers. Conventions are drawing record numbers. Um, the game is incredibly popular. Um, I have heard rumors that in North America, the sales of Age of Sigmar are actually more than 40k right now. Um, which is incredible. Um, 40k is probably the number one miniatures game in the world and it seems like Age of Sigmar might be starting to challenge that um, at least in terms of sales so overall I think our future is really bright it's a really interesting journey that we've all been on you know those of us that have been here from the very beginning of Age of Sigmar since before it actually even released um you know, and I just want to say again, if you want some good comedy, go back to that six months leading up to Age of Sigmar. Watch the Warhammer Weekly News segments um, and uh, listen to all of the leaks and speculation and uh, rumors that flew around. Um, I might actually do some of that myself later today. Um, it's... Uh, We've had a really great time with Age of Sigmar, and going forward, it looks like it's just going to keep getting better. Um, you know, there's always going to be things that make people upset or they don't quite like, but um, overall, the quality of the game is consistently high. And there's always some hiccups and bumps in the road, but they seem to get corrected pretty quickly. So it really makes me very optimistic about what the future looks like and um, I'm excited for it. I am here for the duration. I continue to expand my armies, buy new armies, get excited about things um, and it's fantastic. So that pretty much wraps up this little history lesson, guys. It has definitely been fun. It was fun to compile all of this. And as always, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more. Um, I've got a bunch of other things in the hopper, kind of uh, 
waiting to come out and um thank you to our patrons on patreon um they are helping to improve the quality of content on the channel um if you'd like to make a contribution through Patreon, 100% of our proceeds get used to improve the channel directly, whether that is through new equipment um, or subscription services, software, etc. Um, just things that are going to make the channel better. Uh, so we thank you all, and we will talk to you all later.